here's JB. Thanks for the introduction there, Zach. Um, yeah, uh, I've been with ArborJet now almost 10 years, and um, in the last 10 years, I've learned a lot um, about palm trees. Still a lot more to know. It's, it's, it's really interesting, but um, I hope you find this interesting. It's, it, you know, the title of it is Palm Tree Pest and Nutrient Management, but I want to start with nutrient management because I think that's the most important thing. Um, I think that's one of the main problems uh, when we come with, as far as pest issues are concerned. I think most pest issues, whether it's disease or insects, are all a result of just unhealthy plants, and that's kind of been my philosophy. So we'll, we'll get right into this. And actually, I'm going to go back a slide here. Bear with me. Actually, we'll start with this. So we're going to start with nutrient deficiencies, and I think it's really important. You may have all seen this before, but I've used this pretty much through my whole career. Uh, pH will tell us a lot about what nutrients are available. And if you see this pH chart here, I don't know how many, if most of you are from Florida or not, but this presentation is really going to be more based on what we've learned here in Florida. But you can, um, I'm sure it's applicable anywhere. Uh, but if you look at the pH chart, you know, right around six and a half, seven, that's a good uh, pH, you know, around seven is neutral. And you can see if you draw a line right from that seven up, you can, you can see that all those nutrients are pretty much readily available. Uh, when we get higher pHs, you know, we, we become more deficient in, um, in nutrients like zinc and boron, manganese, which, which can be a real problem with palm trees. So we'll get a little bit here into the different types of nutrient deficiencies once I figure out what direction I'm going here. So we'll start out with nitrogen. You know, um, nitrogen here in Florida is it's more of a problem really in container type stock, container palms. Not so much a problem in palms that are planted in uh, native soils. Um, we do have problems with, with, with nitrogen. I see it a lot in palms like this right here, foxtail palms. And you'll generally see those symptoms appearing on the older fronds. Um, and it's pr pretty easy to identify, um, pretty easy to correct also. Um, we just have a lack of nitrogen in the soils, very sandy soils here. So many um, of the nutrients are, are just not available because they're not available in the soil. Moving on to potassium. Um, this is really uh, a serious problem down here in Florida, and it can really lead to, to the death of the palm. It's, it's, it's that serious. Um, the real telltale signs here, as you can see around the margins of the leaflets, a lot of dead tissue, necrosis. Anytime you have necrosis in a plant, um, that plant is losing the avail availability uh, to, as far as photosynthesis is concerned, you know, producing food for itself. So you can see it's pretty... Um, it's pretty easy to identify. You also get a lot of yellow to orange spots or mottling in, in the fronds. And you can even get some black necrotic spotting, which tells you that that tissue is dying. Um, it's more problematic in sandy soils, which, again, here in Florida, most of our soils are pretty sandy. Uh, so you have a lot of leaching of potassium. Um, I generally recommend, if it's a severe potassium deficiency, to use our phosphagette as a trunk injection. Uh, it's got a good source of potassium in it. The other thing that potassium does to a plant is it helps to harden off the cell walls, thicken the cell walls in a plant. So it makes a plant uh, much uh, healthier and able to sit, uh, withstand certain stresses like drought, too much water, which we have a lot of that here in Florida. You know, a lot of times in the spring we'll have a drought condition and then we'll immediately go into the rainy season and have, you know, torrential downpour. So that's a lot of peaks and valleys for plants. Phosphagette is great for uh, preparing a plant for stress and also for helping a, a plant to recover from stress. And I'll talk about that a little, little later in the talk about the three-step program that we put together. Um, magnesium, we see this a lot in canary date palms here in, in Florida. And you can see those symptoms there in that picture there. You know, the older fronds get a uh, very yellowing, chlorotic looking. Up close, you'll see bands of actual chlorotic bands along the leaflet margins. And also with this disease, too, in, in, when it becomes um, a, a really bad or um, advanced um, deficiency, you'll actually see some necrotic, um, along the, uh, necrotic tissue along the leaf tips. Um, 
We also find, too, that um, a lot of the potassium deficiency can actually be enhanced by magnesium deficiency. So sometimes these lack of nutrients can kind of um, cause more of a deficiency with another nutrient. Um, injections with, like, palm jet, uh, they're very effective, but you have to be patient because it will take some time to correct these conditions. It could even take a couple growing seasons before you really start to see the results. So any of you out there treating palms or if you're injecting palms, you know, the, the customer isn't always going to see a, an immediate reaction. Many times they will, but uh, sometimes it's going to take a little while before you see uh, actual uh, improvement in the plant. Manganesis is another big problem here in Florida. Uh, many different palm species are affected, um, basically caused by an unavailability of, of manganese in the soil in high pH soils, and if you go back to that pH chart you saw there, when you get up, you know, around eight or so, um, manganese becomes very unavailable to the plant. Um, cold temperatures can also reduce root activity, and this all leads to the stress. Uh, just this past winter here in Florida, we had a relatively cold, cold winter, and, uh, you know, we, we tend to, like, take palms that really don't belong in real for instance, I live in central Florida, and a lot of people like to bring these palms up from the south Florida, and a lot of them can't handle that cold temperature. Well, you have cold temperatures like that. It really puts a lot of stress in the plant, and it's also going to even make some of these nutrients even more unavailable, like manganese. Uh, some of the symptoms you'll see are chlorotic streaks, and generally, with most micronutrient deficiencies, you generally see uh, uh, the symptoms on the older fronds, but on this, you'll actually see it in the newer fronds. When it gets advanced, it's, it becomes a, a condition that we call frizzle top. And if you look at that uh, picture up there in the upper left, you can see how that tissue is just kind of curling up, and that's what we call frizzle top. So this was a study that was done actually uh, a few years back. Um, and just to show you the, um, the efficacy of some of these products when they're injected, it's, it's pretty neat. Uh, this was a study that was done. Uh, they applied a uh, soil application, a manganese sulfate, uh, versus the, a palm jet injection. And if you look here in this chart on the left side in month one, one month after the application, you can see the parts per million of the palm jet, the, actually the manganese in the leaf tissue. And this was done on coconut palms. You can see that the, it's up over 100, whereas the soil applied was right, right around 18 or so. Month three, there's actually more parts per million from that injection, and in month three, the untreated, or I should say the soil application was already in a, uh, in a deficiency, and you can see month six there, there's actually a surplus still of manganese. So that, that shows some of the advantages, especially of micronutrients, of, of injecting these into the palms. Iron, um, it's not really that big of a problem uh, in palms down here. Um, and again, it's usually a, a symptomatic relationship to uh, factors that would actually influence the uptake of iron, like poor soil aeration, um, soil compaction, which kind of goes together. So in areas where there's a lot of construction, uh, you, may need, you may see some iron deficiency. Planting too deeply, that's something, uh, not just with palms, uh, we see this all over, that the plants are just planted too deeply in the soil. And you run into a lot of problems there, not just with um, uptake of, of nutrients, but actually uh, suffocation of the roots, too. Uh, root injuries from um, um, construction and other things will also, um, can also result in a, a deficiency in iron. And you can see over there some of the symptoms of the iron deficiency is a modeling of the, of the leaves, kind of spotting. So that's one of the one of the symptoms there. Boron. This is another um, deficiency we see a lot of here in, in Florida, and it really causes the foliage to do some really interesting thing. That that picture there on the left was actually last week. I was in Vero Beach, and those are some foxtail palms. And all the other foxtails looked reasonably good as far as you know deficiencies. And I came across this one here up front, and it was that is just severe. Uh, boron deficiency, so you can kind of hear, see the curling of that, um, of those fronds. And if you look to the right there, that's another symptom that we see with severe uh, boron deficiency is what we call an, an accordion type leaflet. Um, and that looks like that would, that looks like a um, 
queen palm there. We see that a lot. And also you can even see some of the leaflets at the end. They'll actually bend in sharp angles. These are all symptomatic of boron deficiency. Um, in ex it basically, um, uh, in situations of, of extreme deficiency, you can actually even see some necrosis. And the symptoms may look very similar to what uh, lethal yellowing. However, we haven't seen a whole lot of lethal yellowing, uh, at least I haven't, uh, in a while. So one of the solutions is um, PalmJet MG. This is actually, um, we're actually on our fourth generation of PalmJet. We've really come a long way with this product. We, uh, uh, we first developed it back when I started with ArborJet, and that was um, almost 10 years ago. And um, we kind of refined it, and we actually made it so it's much lower rates. The original palm jet was going into an average palm of maybe 75 to 100 milliliters of, of diluted palm jet, which was a, a lot of labor to get it in. And over the years, we've uh, really refined it. This, this product can actually go in um, neat, where you don't have to put any, uh, you don't have to mix it with any water. And the rates are as low on small palms, anywhere from five milliliters, and on the largest palms. 30 milliliters. So you're looking on a large, maybe a large royal palm. At the high rate, you're really only putting a little bit more than an ounce in that palm. And we're seeing long term, and, and we can really turn these palms around fairly quick in many cases. So you can see everything that's in there. It's got some nitrogen, a little bit of phosphorus, some potash, iron, manganese, magnesium, zinc, and boron. So it's a good overall package there. So now we'll get into some of the insect pests. And we've got a lot of insect pests down here. I just want to key on some of the ones that we see a little bit more often. Um, and then I'll get into kind of the piercing, sucking pests. But I, I kind of like to group pests together as how they uh, feed on the plant or how they uh, uh, damage the plant and kind of go that route. Because um, you get to fit a lot of, as far as the control, a lot of different insects under one umbrella. Palm leaf skeletonizer is um, an insect that we're seeing a lot of. And when I first came down here, you know, I was told it was it was more of a um, cosmetic type insect. But when I see, if you look at that, uh, this is a Washingtonia. If you look at that frond on the right there, uh, when you're getting that much damage to active tissue, um, that really puts a lot of stress on the plant. So over time, uh, it can be predisposed to other issues that that could kill that palm. Um, palm skeletonizer is a lepidoptera. It's actually a leaf-feeding caterpillar. Uh, and as you see, as it feeds through those leaflets, it lays its frass in there. Uh, so it's just, you know, it's, it's an eating machine, really, when it's in its larval stage. This is a, uh, a, a study that we did years ago um, at the Gaylord Palms Resort. And you can see the, the bars to the left was the day that we um, installed the study. And the basically, actually that's, that's not correct, that's not percentage of fronds damage, that was the actual number of fronds damage. Each uh, rep that we had, we had untreated, 10 untreated, we had 10 that we did with Azosol, and then we had 10 that we did with MMX and Benzoate, which is triage. Uh, you can see the day of the application, the uh, trees that were treated with Azosol actually had 25 damaged fronds on 10 palms. Uh, the triage treated trees had about 15 damaged palm, uh, fronds on 10 palms. And the uh, untreated, which is the gray bar, there wasn't much damage because we did, those were the ones that were around the pool and they had actually just pruned them so there wasn't a whole lot of damage on them. Came back 35 days after the treatment and you could see the new damage. Almost nothing on the azosol treated palms. The uh, triage, the MMX and benzoate uh, did very well. Um, there was about six damaged fronds. One thing we noticed, though, five of the damaged fronds were on one palm. So we think that in the study, somehow that one of those palms may have been missed. That's my theory on it. And then you can see the, um, the untreated palms were upwards of almost 30 damaged fronds in 10 palms, which is, is pretty significant. Another thing we're seeing a lot of, and again, this is based on, um, I, I believe, uh, environmental stresses on, we're not just seeing it in, in palms, we're seeing it in oak trees, but ambrosia beetle, and there's many, many types of species of ambrosia beetle. There's actually two types of species that I believe have been identified so far uh, that are attacking palms here in Florida. 
Um, but anyways, we kind of treat them all the same way, and the end result is the same. Uh, generally, any ambrosia beetle going after any tree or palm, they're going after trees that are under a lot of stress or actually dying. You know, it's part of Mother Nature, kind of the same way a, a pine bark beetle works. But you can see that picture. These are queen palms. Actually, Pete Dunnington took these pictures. Um, and on the left there, you can actually see the damage done by the ambrosia beetle, and that's the uh, end result there on the right of the dead queen palm. But again, they, they generally attack weak or dying uh, palms. Uh, you will see bleeding and frass found in the trunk. Uh, they will kill the palm, um, but generally that's it's a it's a it's a it's a basically a, a symptom of of a stress. You know they they're going to go after those stressed trees and palms. Uh, treatments are best done proactively um, using the three step program, which I will talk about with the triage G4. Triage G4 does a great job on ambrosia beetles. I've seen ambrosia beetles hit sable palms. I've seen them hit Bismarcks, coconuts. Um, there's many others, and I think we'll find more and more uh, that this insect will be attacking. Red palm mite. When I first came down to Florida 10 years ago, this was a pretty big problem, especially over in the Miami area. And then it kind of, uh, we didn't hear much about it, but now I'm getting more calls on red palm mite. Um, you can see there the, under the magnified picture there on the left, they're very, very small. If you go up to a palm, you can see them generally. They're little, little red mites, look like little red spiders. And they can do some significant damage because they feed in, in such high populations. Um, but some of the palms are, are affected are phoenix species, Christmas palms, coconuts, bird of paradise, which actually isn't a palm, but it gets affected by this too. And you can see in that bottom picture there, you can see kind of how um, the leaves will kind of look chlorotic, but you can see how they kind of feed from the margins into the leaf. So that's a pretty good telltale sign. But really, if you go up to those those leaflets or the fronds, you'll actually, you can actually see them up close, um, little, little red specks on there. Um, again, a good uh, mode of control would be triage. It does a, a good job on, on spider mites and, and conifer mites. So uh, we had actually done some uh, studies early on with the University of Florida with good results um, with the triage. And there's triage G4. So that, that whole group of insects that we just went through uh, triage G4 would be the uh, the recommendation for um, for control. So now we'll get into uh, some of the other really damaging um, um, insects, and one is, is palmetto weevil. Um, if you look here, uh, this the pictures there you can see on the on the far left. That's actually the weevil and. Um, on your screen there, believe it or not, that's almost act, that would, that looks about actual size of how how large those weevil are. So you can see the larva, something that large, it's going to need a good knockdown. It's going to need an it's going to need an, an insect control that's going to get up in the feeding area and be able to knock down a grub that that is that that large. Um, so if you look at the pictures there, uh, this is over in um, the Sarasota area and the picture on the top, the untreated tree had died just before the bottom picture was treated. And the actual bottom picture of that Bismarck palm was under attack from um, the palmetto weevil as well. So that was treated actually while it had active weevil in it. And to this day, that Bismarck is doing fine. So um, there are some, in some cases where you can actually go in and do a curative application uh, to treat these insects. But again, it's going to attack stress palms. Uh, the palmetto weevil is native to Florida. Some of the hosts are Bismarck, uh, Canary, Latan, Sable palms. But one, again, we're seeing this insect attack more and more palms. The other thing that makes this such a damaging insect is a female, can, one female can lay over 200 eggs in a lifetime. Um, the eggs are generally laid at the base of the leaves and they hatch in about three days. The larva will feed in the soft tissue around the apical meristem. So all this feeding, majority of this feeding is going to be um, where, where the damage really happens is in the, um, up in the uh, upper portion of the trunk. And you can see from that picture, uh, you know, once there's enough damage, the, basically the canopy basically will just collapse. Um, they actually uh, form cocoons with the, with the palm fi fibers. And uh, once the cocoon is formed, the adults generally em emerge in a few weeks. Um, so again, best to treat this proactively. And I would recommend if there's susceptible palms that you get them on a program, uh, treating them 
Uh, in areas where you've got high pressure, you may want to do two applications of uh, Imaget per year to keep those trees healthy. Uh, this isn't so much a problem now as it once was, but the Rugo spiraling whitefly was a real problem back in uh, 2012, 2013. But I just want to show you what kind of results we got with uh, using Imaget to treat these. You know, and this would go under the piercing, sucking type um, soft insect uh, category. Um, but with Imaget, you can see there over, that was over a 360-day three, period. Uh, the way we did this study was we actually put plastic plates up into the palms, and not just palms, uh, gumbo limbos and other uh, trees and that that uh, were affected by this insect, because this insect went after many, many different types of trees and palms. But you can see over that 360-day period that the trees that were treated with Imaget had very, very low percentage of sooty mold, and sooty mold is a byproduct of the honeydew that the white flies that they um, excrete. So what happens is that honeydew will basically ferment and turn into the sooty mold. So we found the best way to, to rate whether we were getting control or not was to rate how much sooty mold we had. So that, that's how we went with that. We thought it was much easier than actually counting the insects. So, so all said and done, we got excellent control with Imaget, and in many cases we got anywhere from 18 months to two-year control with one application. And you can see there just um, up at the top there in this picture, you got the adults and the egg masses, and that's a severe infestation. That top picture is actually a gumbo limbo. And then you can see over in this coconut palm frond underneath that just the amount of, of activity in sooty mold. And uh, that's one of our distributors that uh, somebody had brought their truck in, and that's the hood of the truck. And it was a real mess down here, but we got that under control. Uh, some other, and I'm just going to say scale insects in general because there's many types of scales, but again, another piercing, sucking insects. Uh, you want to look for insects on the underside of the leaf. That's where most insects do feed is on the underside of the leaf. And again, you're going to see that presence of honeydew. Um, it's, honeydew is very, very sticky. It's uh, easy to find. Um, and again, you can see the underlying plants with the honeydew on them. So anytime you, anytime you see that honeydew uh, on plants, in a bed, you know, I would say look up um, whatever that piercing, sucking insect is. If you use Imaget, you're most likely going to get very, very good control. Um, if it's an armored scale, a hard scale, what I recommend is to use AceJet first as a knockdown and then follow that up with Imaget. Royal palm bug, this is another uh, insect that's become a real problem, and, and many times this insect is mistaken for a nutrient deficiency because it attacks royal palms, and royal palms are generally very, very tall. So from the ground, and you can see in that bottom picture there, uh, the damage actually might resemble uh, some sort of a nutrient deficiency. The adults are very, very small, so they're very, very difficult to see. You can see in that picture there, um, the upper picture, very tiny. Uh, as they feed, um, they cause yellow spots um, and basically these, these brownish streaks and streaks and wilting. Uh, they'll occur and get worse as the pressure increases. And as the summer goes on, the pressure usually increases. Um, damage is mainly aesthetic, but the long-term feeding will affect the plant health and vigor. And that's why I look at any any of these insects that are um, you know actually attacking live tissue. Over time, that's going to stress the tree or the palm out. And then, you know, if, if that happens year after year, um, it could lead to death. Um, it's interesting, but the smaller um, royals are rarely attacked. It seems like they go and they hit the, the canopies that are much higher up in the air. So, again, for all those piercing, sucking insects, uh, Imaget would be the product of choice. Again, long-term control and uh, very, very low rates. Um, very low light rates relative. I've actually got a slide coming up that will go over that a little bit more. But um, basically, piercing, sucking insects, beetles are, are controlled very well with Imaget. Uh, many, very broad spectrum uh, product. And the Imaget, that is our formulation, as is the triage. And these products were, were actually formulated specifically for trunk injection. And that's why they work so well. We The solvents that we put in these products move the product very effectively through the plant to the pest feeding site, 
and generally when that product gets to the pest feeding site, we get a long-term control. So now we'll talk a little bit about some diseases. And uh, these are some of the more important diseases in palms that we find, uh, bud rot. There's a few different types of bud rot out there, but I know here in Florida, Phytophthora is, is the most common. Um, and, and most palms are susceptible. Um, but I would say if you really want to find out, because the, the, the symptoms are going to be very, very similar, so really the only way to find out what type of bud rot it is is uh, to have it uh, identified in the lab. You'll see discoloration and wilting of the spear leaf. Um, the young leaves are going to turn very chlorotic to, ne again, necrotic. Uh, and what happens then, because of the rot, the spear leaf is just going to collapse, and one way to find out is you'll be able to pull that spear leaf right out of that bud. So, um, yeah, it's a real problem. Uh, especially when we um, to cold damage palms. Like I said, this past year we had, um, in central Florida, I know where I live, we had temperatures in the mid-20s, which is extremely cold for our area and for some for palms. And I did see a lot of the palms that are, are basically more uh, not, not cold tolerant. Uh, I've seen quite a bit of, of damage and even death in those palms. Uh, Theviolopsis uh, trunk rot is another... Uh, type of rot, and um, you can see right there, I took that picture, that was actually up in Destin, Florida, and that's basically what happens is this this, this rot tends to uh, be more in the upper portion of the trunk, and this was after a really bad ice storm, actually freezing event that they had up in Destin in 2014. They had over 48 hours of temperatures that were um, in the teens, and that palm right there is a medjool, and it does not like real cold weather like that. So a lot of the medjools they were losing to trunk rot, and, and the trunks were literally just snapping like that. Um, the, it, one, one thing you want to be sure, too, is make sure you don't have any wounds on the trunk that can become infected. Uh, the rot is definitely more pre prevalent in non-lignified or lightly lignified plant tissue. And that's the tissue that is generally in the upper third of the trunk, and that's why we see generally that top third of the trunk will snap. So, uh, again, a good, uh, for this and the uh, bud rot, a good a preventative, um, get them on a program would be Phosphagette. It does a great job on these types, and Phosphagette does a great job on Phytophthora, which is, um, again, here in Florida, one of the main bud rot issues that we have. Fusarium wilt, another um, issue that we have, it, this, this Fusarium oxysporum was mainly found in Queen Palms and Washingtonia, but over the past few years we are finding it in a lot of other types of palms. Uh, there's another Fusarium that will uh, hit the uh, canary date palms. That's a different species, but um, this is the one we mainly see here in, in Florida. Uh, basically it's our sim symptoms. Um, you can see down in that picture in the right uh, you can see the dark brown stripe on the pedial. And internally, when you cut it, you'll see one portion of the pedial will probably be much darker as that disease moves through. You'll also see the fronds, if you look at the, the bottom right picture, as you look at the fronds of the palm, you'll see one half of the frond die off before the other. Um, once, the, once the palm has it, there's not a whole lot you can do for it, but we have seen some results of using Phosphagette as a, a preventative. With most diseases, whether it's turf or plants, it's always better if you have a plant, turf, tree, or palm that is susceptible, it's always better to get them on a proactive uh, treatment program than, than waiting for the, uh, the disease to, to form. So that phosphogen, again, it's a 45.8% phosphorus acid. It does a lot of things. Like I was saying before, it really helps to strengthen the cell walls. It works as a fungicide. It also helps the plant to release its own chemicals to help control diseases. Uh, we do have a new label coming out, um, or it is out, I should say, that uh, we can actually spray it now, which is nice. Um, so different sites, uh, uses for that product. So it's not just going to be an injectable product anymore. But it also does a great job on things like hypoxylon canker and thracnose. Uh, but we see great results in all plant material with this product, and especially in palms. Whenever you drill into a palm, you know, if you're doing OTC applications, you're doing, doing uh, anything, whether it's for insect control, I always say put some phosphagen in there. It's going to be very, very beneficial, especially uh, with all the stresses that we have. 
Uh, lethal bronzing, uh, this was actually, it used to be called Texas Phoenix Pollen Decline, but now uh, they changed the name to lethal bronzing because it really kind of tells you more of the symptoms of this, this disease. The lower, older fronds will, will turn, generally, they'll turn a bronzish color. That's one of the telltale signs. Um, it's a bacterial disease. The bacteria is, is a phytoplasm. Uh, there's many species affected. Um, again, the older fronds will turn reddish brown and to have a kind of a bronze effect. We just recently finished a study with some great information. I don't want to go through all the information here, but we have a white paper, and we showed significant enhancement of control by using Imajet and then also using Phosphajet and Palmjet. If anybody wants that white paper, uh, you can either email myself or email Zach, and we will get that information out to you. But it's, it's really a good read, and we were really excited about that paper. Uh, when we when we finish the study, we've actually got another study going on here in Florida as well with some other products uh, with um, lethal bronzing as well. So we try to find these really uh, problem situations, and we try to uh, we try to make a, a, a an approach to try to you know try to solve these problems. Always have have issues here. And as far as the uh, treatment for the the. Uh, tree once it gets at Arbor OTC, but again, using that alongside of the Imajet, Phosphajet, and Palmjet will give you even that much more of a robust um, control and program. Some other issues um, I want to talk about here too, because it's not all about disease and insects. You know, we do have uh, we had uh, a major storm come through here last year with Irma, and the year before we had Matthew. Um, we've had a lot of issues with uh, cold temperatures. We had cold damage. Uh, we've had a lot of issues with a lot of water, um, and we've had drought. So we've had a little bit of everything. And, and you know, uh, back in my Davy days, we learned that too much or too little of anything to a plant is not good. We want more consistent, you know, uh, soil moisture, consistent temperatures, but we don't always get that. Another thing here in Florida, too, especially where I live in central Florida, I think we have the lightning capital of, of the uh, country. Uh, we do get a lot of lightning strikes. You have to remember that, that palm trees hold a lot of water, so they actually become lightning rods. So um, we do see that, and I do get calls on it, and it's, it's fairly easy to identify, as you can see in that picture in the, in the uh, middle right there. Some other issues, and it was funny, we were just, uh, we're, we're at a conference here in, uh, in Florida for FNGLA, and we were just out walking the grounds, and Pete Dunnington sent me these pictures, and then I went out, and uh, th this is damage done by climbing spikes, and you can see all the, uh, the holes, the puncture wounds into these Washingtonia and the bleeding. Uh, do not use climbing spikes. This is very damaging to the tree. Um, it's, it's unnecessary damage, really. Um, but I get a lot of people saying, well, you know, what, you know they ask about drilling into, the, into a palm. Well, when we drill into a palm, we're, we're sealing that hole off with an arbor plug. Um, and this here, this, 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 is, this is, is real damage to the tree, um, as you can see. So now we'll get into the injection. So I want to go over now real quick. If you look here, this was, this was actually up in Destin. I showed you that, um, that uh Majul that had uh, had the trunk rot that snapped. Um, these majules here were also affected uh, in that same ice storm in 2014. This is 16 months after the application. The one on the left was treated with the three-step program, so it was treated with Imajet, Phosphajet, and Palmjet, and the palm on the right was untreated. And you can see the difference in, in the canopies of those two palms. So the one on the left is much healthier. Um, as far as the injection advantages, we're delivering that treatment inside the tree. The material is sealed in the tree, and we have a reduced exposure, which is very, very important. You get the full dose in the tree, very long residuals. With most of uh, this three-step program, it is usually just going to be an annual treatment. Um, in, in certain situations, if you have high pressure of, let's say, palmetto weevil, I would, um, I would recommend a, an added injection, or if you're doing... Uh, you know, if you're treating for Texas Phoenix Palm Decline, the lethal bronzing, uh, you're going to be doing three to four injections a year. So I would say you might as well include that three-step program right along with the OTC. And we, we now have the data to show that that really enhances the uh, control. 
Um, also helps to keep within legal per acre pesticide limits. You know, when you're out there doing soil applications and drenching, you do have to be careful that you're, you're obeying that label and you're not going over the legal use per acre, um, especially if you're doing large trees, palms, a good chance with some of those products, if you are drenching, you could be going over that 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 legal use. Um, you have a wide open treatment window, and down here in Florida, we have a lot of wind, a lot of rain, a lot of sand. That means we can't do much spraying, anyways. We're you know right now it's the rainy season. We're getting rain every day here, and we've got sandy soil, so we just don't have holding capacity for uh, for root type applications. If you look here, this chart is a good chart here. This wasn't done on palms. I just want to show you the efficacy of Imaget. If you look at the column on the right, these are different imidacloprid products, and you can see uh, some of these products like Imicide at their labeled rate. They had 2.9 parts of active ingredient in the leaf tissue. The Wedgel had 7.3. If you look at the Imaget at the labeled rate, had 320.7. That is huge. Not only the number, but it's it's huge also because we're, we're getting such a good dose of product in there that we're knocking these insects out. The problem is when you have those low doses there that you may predispose that insect uh, to become immune to it. It'll build up a tolerance where it won't control that product anymore. So now you've got a resistance problem. Um, so that's why you want to avoid multiple treatments of low doses of insect control products because that insect can build up a tolerance. If you look at the the bar of the Merit 200 SL, that was another injectable pro, uh, product. They put that in this study using ArborJet equipment. That product was applied at almost twice the amount of active ingredient as the Imaget, yet the Imaget still had a, 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 almost 100 times more parts in the leaf tissue than did the Merit. So I think that's pretty neat. And then the last, um, the last one there is the Merit soil drench. Uh, that was applied at almost three times the amount of active ingredient, and that had 0.2. So you can see that uh, these products that are formulated for trunk injection, like Imaget, when they're applied in the tree or the palm, um, you're going to get a, you're going to get a lot of muscle up into those areas to control those insects. So I wanted to show you this real quick too, and I know we're kind of running out of time here. I want to get some time for some of your questions. But I thought this is a kind of a neat slide. I put this together. A medium-sized palm, which is the majority of palms that we would be treating down here in Florida, uh, requires about 20 milliliters of Imaget. That's about 0.68 fluid ounces, okay, for season-long control of piercing, sucking insects. Um, when you look at that and break it down even further, it's a 5% formulation. So the tree or the palm is protected for one year with really just one milliliter of active ingredient in that palm. That shows you the efficacy and, and how trunk injection, you're moving all that product up to the pest feeding site where it needs to be. So if you look at this by comparison, a teaspoon is five milliliters. So that's one fifth of a teaspoon uh, in a, a pretty large palm to control those pests for a full season. And then some, like I said, with the even spiraling white fly, we were getting even longer control than that. Um, this is the arbor plug right here. And what we do is we drill into the palm. In most cases, palms are monocots. So in many cases, you just need one injection point. So it's not like we're putting a lot of, uh, you know, uh, not, not putting a lot of holes in these trees. We're trying to minimize that. I've been tending late, lately. I've been learning uh, or kind of uh, looking at keeping these plugs lower. I know originally we were looking, it would seem easier to inject these palms higher up in the trunk. But now, since we've got the quick jet air, um, and we can actually uh, regulate the pressure. I've had a lot more luck uh, injecting these palms down low, and it's, it's just better because it, from, from an aesthetic standpoint, you, you don't see that plug. Um, if you look at the arbor plug, basically what it is, it's a, now we have those is a two-piece plug with a rubber septum, so the needle goes through it. You inject the product. You pull the needle out. Every, everything stays uh, sealed in that tree or that palm. And here's the steps to the injection. Uh, drill about a third of the way into the trunk. Always disinfect your drill bit when you go from tree to tree or palm to palm uh, so you're not spreading any pathogens. Set the plug. We get, all we do is put the plug set around there, uh, pound it in with a hammer, and inject. So that's the, um, the whole process there. Again, how many plugs? In most cases, one plug per palm. 
When we do like larger canaries, some of those canaries can have a pretty large diameter. We may put two, three, or even four plugs in those, but you know, that, that's, that's a call you'll need to make while you're out there. Um, but again, most palms, just, just one plug. And again, the difference between a tree and a palm is a, a tree is a dicot, many, many buds. A palm is a, a monocot. A tree puts out growth rings and compartmentalizes in the trunk where a palm won't. Uh, basically, with a palm, you've got all your, your xylem and your phloem all intermingled in that vascular bundle in the center of the trunk. I kind of look at it like conduit with all that stuffed in there. And palms will hold a lot of water, so... Uh, one thing we do look for is when you're getting a lot of rain, you may want to wait for those palms to dry out a little bit before you try to inject them because you'll have a lot of positive pressure in those palms uh, from all the, uh, the moisture. So some products here real quick. AceJet, very broad spectrum. It's, it's acephate. A quick knockdown, we call this our 911 product. Uh, controls many types of insects. Um, it does have a shorter residual than like our triage products or our uh, ImageJet products. Uh, but if you want a really quick knockdown, especially of like leaf feeding caterpillars and that, uh, use AceJet. And what I recommend is to follow the AceJet up with either a triage or an ImageJet for your long-term control. We went over the Arbor OTC. It's an oxytetracycline product. Uh, it's an antibiotic, and we use this for any bacterial type diseases. Um, you can see the list there, leaf scorch, fire blight, again, for uh, Texas Phoenix Palm Decline, which is now we're call, just so you know we're calling that uh, lethal bronzing now. So that would be the product to use um, once that tree or the palm has um, the uh, or or if it's susceptible, uh, you want to put the OTC in the pro program. But again, uh, best to do it with the ImageJet, PhosphaJet, and the PalmJet. As a saw, this is our Omri listed. It's a uh, it's listed as an organic product. It's a azadiractin. It's six percent azadiractin product powder, I should say. It mixes, uh, it's totally uh, water-soluble. Uh, we can inject this. We can also spray it. We've got great results with this. Um, if you want to talk to me, I put some programs together for fruit trees with this uh, injected. The nice thing about this product, too, very broad spectrum, but also uh, the customer can eat the fruit the same day. There's no interval to harvest with this product. It comes from the neem tree. So real quick on the three-step program, what we have here is um, uh, insect control with either ImageJet or triage, depending on what the, the pest is. Um, in some cases, you may have both uh, piercing sucking type pests, let's say, and, and maybe a leaf feeding caterpillar, um, ambrosia beetle. You know, some palms you may be treating for piercing sucking insects and ambrosia beetle. You can actually use both and actually make it a four-step program. Uh, disease and stress control with phosphajet and a nutrition with uh, our palm jet MG. Average cost of a palm to the service provider is right around $11. So it can, it's a very, very profitable program. Um, if anybody would like this, I do have a, an overview of the three-step program. Um, I'm not going to get all into this now, but if you want that, um, we can definitely email that out to you. And this is the, the palms that I was talking about before in depth, and this was the day that we did the application. So the palm on the left was treated, the palm on the right was untreated. And if you look at their canopies, the palm on the right is shorter, but their canopies are pretty similar as far as, as, um, as, far as where, where, their, you know, where their growth is, where the new growth is. And the one on the right doesn't look that bad nor does the one on the left, they just needed some pruning there. This is uh, about six months after the treatment. It's the following June. Actually, it's about eight months after treatment. You can see the one on the left already has a better canopy and is putting out much better new growth than the one on the right. And that's the picture that I showed you before. So that was about uh, 16 months after the, um, after the initial application. And nothing else was done to those in, in, uh, during that, that time period. So quick jet air, again, uh, this is our most um, productive piece of equipment. This is what most are using now on palms. It's a very simple piece of equipment. It's uh, run by an air tank that pushes the piston that just drives the product into the tree. The nice thing about this with palms is uh, with the old, with our original quick jet, uh, we had situations where some were putting too much pressure uh, when they were injecting in the palms. Palms don't require a lot of pressure. I generally set that quick jet air at about 40 uh, PSI and then work it from there. But generally that will be enough to push the product in the palm without doing any damage. And that also helps reduce any bleeding 
Um, what's, if you overpressurize it, what you'll actually get is some blow-by around the plug, and we don't want that. So uh, quick jet air, keep the pressure nice and low in palms. It's a nice, easy injection. You can see right there I'm with a customer, and we're doing a canary. And uh, he's got the plug set really low there, which, which I like. So um, nobody's going to see those plugs, and he's getting all the product in uh, very effectively. Uh, for the quick jet, I want to mention, too, that we do have an inlet check valve on it. Uh, some are still using the quick jet for the palms, which is fine. It works, but all, all I can say is don't overpressurize it. Don't try to force the product in with the quick jet. Let it, let it ease in. But that new valve, is, it greatly reduces the clogging. That was one of the issues that we had with that. Uh, it's a push to connect uh, where the line goes in, so the, it's less stress on tu the tubing. And also, we did have some issues where the, 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 the line would actually separate from the old valve very easily. Quicker setup, and uh, it can be retrofitted to all quick jet devices, so it's an aftermarket piece uh, that can be applied to your current quick jet. One thing I want to mention, too, and we're kind of running out of time to run through this real quick, is very important from the start, you know, when we plant plant material, the best way to get that plant off to the best start is to make sure that, that, um, that it's planted correctly, okay? So I don't want to get to all through this because I want to have some time for questions, but don't be – the one thing that I see that is a major problem, and not just here in Florida but throughout the country, is plant material that's planted too low. You're really getting that plant off to a bad start, uh, you're going to have a lot of problems if you're planting things too deep. Palms like to be, you know, really just a little, you know, where the top of that root ball can even be up a little bit higher than the um, than the uh, the grade even. That's better than too deep. And also when planting, a great thing to also uh, use is the Nutri-Root because this is going to help to promote, promote root growth. It's got uh, seaweed extracts that help as a uh, rooting hormone, kelp to feed biology, it's got a surfactant to help move this product down. It's got uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and it's also got a micronutrient package. And another great thing it has is hydrotain, which helps to pull moisture down to the root system. So when you're doing a new planting, I highly recommend using Nutri-Root, and you can even use it as a maintenance uh, fertilizer as well. It's a great product. Also pruning, real quick, the, the, you can see these Washingtonia. On the left, that's what a Washingtonia should look like after it's pruned. You can see the ones on the right, they went way too high. I like to see pruning no more than a nine and three, you know, even a little lower. Um, if you're looking at the clock, don't be taking any fronds up any higher than nine and three. But the ones on the right were just uh, pretty much butchered there. Okay, we'll open it up uh, for questions. No questions? Nick, JB, it doesn't look like uh, anyone typed anything in during the day. If uh, you want to flip to the last slide, uh, whomever is on and still wants an ISA credit, uh, that it's in the next slide. That means I either did a good job or everybody's asleep right now? 